How would you describe what it is you see? Okay. Not in terms of color, but I'd like you to use these words, right? Um, the thing. Right? Good, good. Do you see the whole thing? Louder? Yes. Yeah, okay. So we can see the thing, but not the whole thing. Do you see the whole thing? I guess not. What do you see? The thing. What? The thing. No. Watch. Do you see the whole thing, or do you just see one side of it? I see one side. Do you see the back of it? If you turn it around again. Uh-uh. Do you see the back of it? No. Then you don't see the whole thing. Right. Oh, you only see a part of it. That's true. Oh, okay. oh, 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 oh. Do you uh, ever see all of the parts? Yes. Oh. To see all of the parts, then you have to remember the part that you're not looking at. True. Right? So it's a memory trip. Okay. You ever see the unity of the parts? Ever see the unity of the parts together? Uh, I'm going to say yes. You would say yes, okay. I can I can see that thing though. I can see that piece of chalk. Would you agree? You don't see you don't see the whole, you don't see the unity, you infer it, don't you? Oh, all right. Well, because you can't see the unity. It's not visible. Because the unity is seeing all the parts together into a, but if you don't, but if, yeah. therefore, no. ah. Um, watch now. Ever see a thing? Good, 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 good. No. <laughs> I got a little bit thing backwards. A means what? One. One, right? When you say you see one thing now, I want to know what it is you're seeing at the moment you say, yep, I see that one thing. Go ahead. <laughs> because you only see a part, but you're sure you see one thing. Agree? So you can get to see one thing even though you only see a part. Is that right? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> wait, <laughs> wait a minute. Do you see one thing or do you see a part of one thing? Uh, be a part of one thing. Well, then you don't see one thing. No, don't see one thing. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I want to know what is it we claim to do when we say we see anything, one thing, right? What is it? Because in one sense, whatever you're looking at, it has to be one. So all you're seeing is ones. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. 
I want to know when, whenever you see, whatever, whenever, at the moment you say, I see one thing, I'm interested in knowing whether that's an experience or not. Or if it is an experience, what kind of an experience it is. Right, are we together? I think so. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> So we need to say, uh, we have to use this word in such a way that we can apply it to many particular things. And what we mean by many is each. But that's another word for one, isn't it? So, uh, you have to help me with this. Um, so, you, all you're doing then is seeing the same thing wherever it is you look, because all you're seeing is A or each or one, 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 one. But, and all the things differ except in respect to there being one. Would you be so kind if I showed you this figure, and this figure, and this figure, and ask you what's common to them, is it likely you'd say pink? Sure. Or red? Would you? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. In the same way, would you tell me, since you keep seeing, wherever you're looking, one thing, what is that one you see everywhere? Just as you did so well and skillfully, when you said red or pink. Like everything you see is different, right? Right. Even if you see two things that are exactly the same, at least they're different in respect to space and time. Mm -hmm. So they're all, everything is different though, each is a what? One. One, okay. What's the one thing that runs through them all that you call one? Would you take help? I'll take help. Each one is unified somehow. They're all but they all contain that. Is there a difference between one and, and unified? Is that you? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Do it again? Uh, <laughs> Can each part be one part without being a unity? Yeah. Well, I would just say that each one is itself unified. Pardon me. All... Unified usually comes from the word unity, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Can there be unity without parts? Mm, yeah. Huh? Mm. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Okay, come on, help me out. Would you agree, whatever you're looking at, it's a what? A one. Good, good. What's common to them all by virtue of what you call each one of them a one? You, 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 unity. Look, would you agree, I can line up a whole bunch of things like this. And you'll say. Each one is unified. You'd say tree, wouldn't you? Trees. Uh, right, tree. right, 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 right. And so. If each one of these is, uh, what's common between them all that? They're all one. Yeah, what's the oneness of that the ones have? <laughs> Would you mind telling me and stop fooling around? <laughs> I told you, the unification. But unity means many into one, doesn't it? Yeah. Parts, parts into a whole. Well, now that, yeah. then what you mean by unity is only some things have a unity, other things may be just a particular part that doesn't have a unity. Mm -hmm. 
Like, can each idea be one? And some ideas, like zero, don't have any parts, a unity, but there's still a one? Well, yeah, zero. One zero? One. We'd say, well, zero is a unity of all its parts. Oh. Mm. Uh, well, there's no such thing as zero. It's zero over one. So it's, <laughs> it's one. Right? Zero divided by one. Okay, well, <laughs> look here. There must be something we're pointing to when we keep, so like this is one, right? This is one. This is one. That's one. This one. That's one. Right, right, all over. They're all different. And we call them by the same word, each, one. I guess we have to say oneness. Do you like that term? But that just means there's a quality of one, a quality of one that gives it a mode of existence, doesn't it? Ness, quality. Well, then all we need to grasp is what this is in order to get the quality of this to use this. And if it has this, you're going to say it's the same as this. Is that right? Okay, look here, let me change it. Um, is what each thing, is what each thing really is? Look here, is what each thing Is it oneness? Or it being a particular one? Like, would you not agree you can have some kind of object? It may go through incredible changes from the beginning to where it is, and it finally disappears and goes through many changes. But it's still, through that whole some one thing, there's something that remains the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that, that doesn't, it's still something you can point to as one. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the things that change have no effect on it still being a one. one. <clears throat> okay, what is, is. what is that? Since it appears, I'm wondering about that. Well, because you can say it about anything that goes through changes, can't you? Yes. Comes into being, passes out of being, goes through multiple forms. It's still a one. Mm -hmm. huh. <laughs> I'll get an answer. Guy makes fun of me. We need someone, perhaps, who even dreams in numbers to answer, do you know? <laughs> oh! Like, what is one? <laughs> then we'll get to two in a minute. One is one. One? One is one. Of course one is one. <laughs> Wait a minute, is that an answer? No. I mean, can't just, okay, that's enough. One is one, okay. That answers it. <laughs> it's either a phony question or it's a real question. And you have to decide what it is. Because where we're going, that's the question. Very difficult to talk about one or the one. We can tell us, like you said, Ness is like three Ness. Uh, yeah. Right, one Ness is. Yeah, look, would you go further and say, perhaps we can take something that goes through such changes from, the, from its origin to its final dissolution, 
that through those changes, it goes through so many remarkable changes that sometimes it's difficult to believe it's the same thing. Is that possible? Yes. Therefore, there's something about it, but still remains what it is through all the changes. What is that one about which the thing is? Like, see, science is stupid. Agree, everybody? Together. Science <laughs> is stupid. <laughs> right? Good. Good. Like, because, right, what are they continuously doing? All they do is one thing in physics. Right? They take a Schlafdorfen, right? And then they get some guy... to pound these little things and break them up and find out what they're made of. And then they take the little pieces and then they move over and hit it again with a bigger hammer. Right? So they keep getting bigger and bigger hammers to hit smaller and smaller pieces. Right? And no matter how small they are, they still got pieces and parts to them. Don't they? Yeah. That doesn't end, does it? No. They continually subdivide because no matter how small it is, it would be great in comparison to something smaller than it. Agree? I mean, it could be enormous. Right? All right. All right, 135 zeros. That's nothing compared to infinity. Right. Unending. Right. So no matter how small they get, it's giant compared to what can be really be infinitely small, right? It's giant. So they'll still get bigger and bigger hammers. But what does that mean though? It means they can they finally say what a thing is? Or would you say, yeah, when you know all the parts, that's what you, that, then you know what the thing is. Yeah, because my doctor knows me thoroughly because he knows all my parts. <laughs> yeah, that's why medicine doesn't need psychology. A great miss, because if you know all the parts, then you know the person. No, I don't agree. <laughs> what? You mean there's something more than the parts? This is very... It's a terrible thing to say. I know about science. Sorry. All right. Okay. We'll apologize to science. See, because uh, that's the problem here. See, part. No. When you know the parts of anything, do you finally know what the thing is, or do you simply know its parts? Is there something in addition about the nature of anything other than knowing its parts so that you can claim you thoroughly know it on the basis of knowing all its parts? You would say? I'm driving you in two directions. We're talking about what is it we're calling one, and we're shifting to what a thing is. Right? I'm trying to therefore get you to think about under what condition can you say you know a thing? <clears throat> Even if you know the parts and how they are unified, would you say then you know what the thing is? Yeah. Because when all the parts of the human body are functioning together, then it's health, and then you know the person. Because every person who's healthy knows himself, and everybody knows him thoroughly, because they, all they need to know is whether all the parts are functioning together, and therefore you don't need psychology. No? Wrong. I mean, there's still something there? Still something there. The issue is going to be whether that same wonder is about anything. What the thing... See, what is the thing inherently? <clears throat> what is it? 
Well, that's it. Now go one more step higher. Hi. Well, I just keep hearing the word essence, and what? I just I keep hearing the word essence. Like, what I, is the thing's essence? I, I never use that word. Or essential. I was careful. Really? You want to well, use it? Go ahead. It just keeps coming to my mind. So. No, no, please. You're saying. Is it possible if you know the thing, then you know its essence? Yes. Okay. Or, or that that is the... Okay. At what point can you say you know the essence of something? That. You'd say that's when you ask Brad. That's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I like what you said earlier, how you don't use the word essence. Well... Hmm. Okay. Would you agree you're all familiar with the first hypothesis to some degree? Fair enough? Yeah. Here's the issue now, see? If the first hypothesis is a de negativa, that about which you can say nothing, right? If you can only say negatives about it, then the only thing, you can't even say it's one, can you? Because that's still saying something, right? Still giving it something. So you can't even call it one. Because that suggests it's a number. Right. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there something very strange about the first hypothesis? Right? Because we know it can't be a whole. Mm -hmm. Right? For if it were a whole, if a whole is made up of many parts, that would be a manyness, that can't be a whole, etc. Mm -hmm. So therefore, there's nothing you can say about it, nothing you can apprehend, because there's nothing you can apprehend there to be able to apprehend it. Then what's the difference between a any any a thing and uh, the one you cannot name? See, if everything is truly a one, but when you get down to trying to understand what this one is, if you're using Plato's first hypothesis, you're left with a mystery, aren't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So is it equally true then that no matter what you experience, it shares the very same mystery? If so, hey, next up, then Parmenides could have concluded, or we can conclude for Parmenides, and say uh, the first hypothesis well, the first hypothesis is ineffable. Uh, first hypothesis is ineffable. Wait a minute, if that's true, then everything is ineffable to the degree that you're saying it's one. So therefore everything is a profound mystery, it's ineffable. But if you're calling it a thing, doesn't that presuppose, right, a thing, then, then that's presupposing being, isn't it? A thing, if it's a thing, it has existence. But look here, look here. Would you answer me one question? I'll try. Okay. 
What says? Oh, I've been taught that that's called tissue paper. Okay. I have it, don't I? Yes. Am I different than what I have? Yes. Uh, is this me or do I have a chalk? You're holding a chalk. Does the object have an essence? Um, no. <laughs> Otherwise, come on, if it did have an essence, that wouldn't be it. <clears throat> it would be what it possesses. Agree? Okay. The qualities of something is not the thing, is it? No. Or do the qualities just run around without anything there that's attached to the qualities, that possesses the qualities? What would you say? I would say that... Um, so, ladder. yeah, look, everything has a being, doesn't it? <clears throat> well, no. <laughs> Have you just changed your mind? No. Good. All right. Would you use the word being again and then essence? Does this have a being or essence? For if it has it, has means to possess, does it not? Yes. Well, the thing is different than what it possesses. Yes. Right. Well, therefore, the thing is nude. And it just, <clears throat> if this goes through all the changes, back to those, then all the ways in which it changes is not it, because it still is there and endures in spite of all the changes. Right. Therefore, if usia or being or any of those words or what is, is something the thing has or possesses, then it's just like any other quality that falls away. It's not, a, not the thing, is it? Say that last part again. If, it, if, if that which is continuous has being, then it's just like its qualities? Is that what you just said? I don't know. Say, is this me? No. Because? Because. Whatever that, I possess is different than me. Yes. Ah. <clears throat> Would you say the same thing for a red, a red, whatever you want to call it? Yes. Or is red a quality of something? No, that's, uh, right, it's a, like a red rose is, is not, right, it, no, it participates no. in red. Yeah, so you want to, what is the thing that independent of all of its qualities? Yeah, right. I bet it's just like every other thing when it's separated from all of its qualities. What, what, could you say, what if you say something like, um, no, it's still not good. Okay, good. Well, Always glad when someone gives up. Well, no, I, I was... No, no I, it helps. I, okay, I was going to uh -oh, say... Uh-oh, she's back. No, okay. I was going to say, what, what if you... What if, like, I could say that your your Pierre-ness... Your Pierre-ness makes you Pierre. Part two, then again, Like, your, your Pierre-ness. Pierre-ness. Pierre, she, she's talking about your Pierre-ness. The what? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know. No, I don't like, know what she's talking about. Well, you were going to help her, and no, you don't know what she's saying. No, I mean Would like, you mind helping her? What do you mean? I mean, like, um, the, what makes you unique, there's something unique to you. Well, would you mind like, describing it and stop the nonsense? I just said it's, it's your pureness. It's like your, it's your, it's the, it's your unit, it's your unity. It's your now, unity. unity. Do you have the unity? Do I have? No, you don't. Nobody has it. I don't. No know. one has it. It just is. It, it just no. Is. See, you slipped back into a quality when you said it has a unity. <clears throat> okay. Well. Yeah. Okay. See, this is where Damascus is going. He's saying, in the strictest sense. The first hypothesis identifies something that is really ineffable. 
And if you want to hold on to that, then anything that is, whatever it is, is going to be called a one. Therefore, it's going to take on the very same idea, and therefore everything is, in essence, ineffable. There's a profound mystery about everything, all the way down to a grain of sand to the highest cosmos, or galaxy, or universe. But therefore, nothing is without its mystery. Is that right? Is that right? Oh. That's where we're going. That's Demonskis. This is where he's going. And he's going to use exquisite dialectic to get you there. So I thought we'd try a couple. Oh, thank you. I don't know. Is this? Which, which one? It's a grapefruit. No, no, thank you. I'm on. Uh, take a break for a moment, okay? Yeah. I, I'm on quinine water. Well, that's what's happening now. No. Use, <clears throat> and he uses it with great skill. <clears throat> All. And <clears throat> he has to demonstrate that his first hypothesis is insufficient. There's a fundamental weakness about it because it doesn't end in the ineffable. <clears throat> So, let's see. How about the first one? The argument, Damascus, on first principles. Good enough? Mm -hmm. What I like about it is that uh, um, <clears throat> um, it's only two sentences in length. Of what nature is the one principle of all things? Although we are accustomed to say that all things proceed from the one, the one itself is totally exempt from the all. <clears throat> nor, is there any, nor is there any reciprocal relationship between it and that which proceeds from it. The principle of all things is exempt even from such a simplicity as that of the one. See, the principle of all things is exempt. It stands apart. <coughs> now, wait a minute. Isn't the principle of all things one of the things in the universe? Perhaps not. Well, <laughs> then it's not exempt from the all. The one itself is totally exempt from the all. But wait a minute. <laughs> if the all is missing the principle, it's not all. Agree? Agree? If the, if, can you say that again? If the one is missing what? If the all? Here's the all. Yeah. Everything. By the way, the principle is exempt from the all. Yeah. Then the, that principle is not contained in the all. Right. Well, then it's not all. Right. Unless <clears throat> it proceeds right? from the principle. Well, that, that's rather curious, right? Look, <clears throat> we cannot strictly speak of it as a principle or cause or first. In the very act of thinking about it, we separate ourselves from it. 
if the one is the cause and container of all things, what ascent is there for us beyond this? Now look here. The argument that we can have no conception of anything beyond the one, it's not conclusive. Because that which is beyond our comprehension, <laughs> our, beyond our comprehension is more vulnerable than that which we can comprehend. Now, this is where he makes the step into intuition. <clears throat> here it is. argument that we can have no conception of anything beyond the one, it's not conclusive. Why? Because that which is beyond our comprehension is more venerable than that which we can comprehend. By the way, is it true that if you comprehend all things, you know one thing? That there's something beyond what you can, you can comprehend? Look, there are two words that are often mixed that play a role that might be helpful, all right? Limit, boundary. <clears throat> okay. A boundary, the difference between a limit and a boundary is that a limit <clears throat> A boundary is that you know there's something on the other side of it. That's the difference. Right? Wherever you talk about it, with something having a boundary, the language you're using presupposes that there must be something on the other side of the boundary. When you use the word limit, <clears throat> no. Which is why the astronauts, when they made that last trip, found that remarkable. They found a sign <laughs> over one of the asteroids, asteroids that said, beyond this, there's nothing. So they knew they reached the limit. I saw that in the paper. You saw that in the paper, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so look here, see? Which one of these is he pointing to? The, look here. The one is not, it's not conclusive. It says here, we can have no conception of anything beyond the one. It's not conclusive. Why? Because that which is beyond our comprehension is more venerable than that which we can comprehend. Ah, oh, you can comprehend this. Therefore, he's saying, wait a minute. The idea of boundary means there's something beyond it more venerable, yeah. more profound than reaching the limit. The first principle is beyond all antitheses, such as, right, such as of one and many, or prior and posterior, because of its transcendent unity. If that is most honorable, which is beyond all our conceptions, and this is nothing, then nothing is twofold. The ineffable height and the ineffable depth. Right? Nothingness can go in two ways, right? As nihilism, the depth, or nothingness, meaning that which is totally beyond limit and boundaries. It's beyond it. Right? Therefore, you can say nothing, nothingness. Two extremes. What's his assumption? That we really have, we really have an intuition that this is true. Really, you have, a, you have an insight. You have everyone has an insight. 
all things come forth from it ineffably as from an atom. But language and thought are subverted by its incomprehensibility and reveal only the manner in which we are baffled by its mystery. What does language do? It brings us to realize that we are baffled by the mystery of the ineffable. Isn't that great? Wow. That's true. Hey, this is either so or not. <clears throat> You're saying that. We all know this. Got to see it, though. Now he goes back on the fourth, fifth point to Parmenides. <clears throat> The one, says Plato, if it is, it's not the one. And if it is not, no words can describe it, nor can any name or even negation be predicated of it. Neither can there be any knowledge of it. The one is thus altogether ineffable. Shall we seek anything beyond this? Perhaps, right, just perhaps, Perhaps Plato leads us ineffably to that ineffable which lies beyond the one and then is silent where language fails. So he's got the one and above the one, the ineffable. Right? No demonstrations can be made of it. Our intuition rises only so far as to the one. Nevertheless, because there is in us a vestige of the one, we should, ex we should ex exert ourselves in reaching up towards it. But let that which is beyond be adored in complete silence and mystical unknowing. Right, this is the mystical unknowing. This is the great unknowing. Hey, in what manner is it what manner is it said to be unknown? Uh, I say, do we even know that it's unknown? Huh. When we say this, we mean that we are affected thus in regard to it, because there is nothing by which we can take hold of it. That which is most unknown must be most transcendent of all. Well, wait a minute. If you can make this jump from the one to the ineffable, that follows. Because there is nothing by which we can take hold of it. That which is most unknown, that's most transcendent of all. We can form no true opinion of it. And that which uh, we do form must be a vain one, a vain opinion. For it, hey, it's beyond opinion can't be discovered, cannot be discovered. It's beyond all things. All other things are in some respect known and in some respect unknown. But it, it's utterly, utterly unknown. It's beyond even divine knowledge because not even such a distinction as between knower and known can subsist in it. Although we can only approach it by denying of it all finite attributes, 
Negation itself cannot truly be attributed to it because even negation refers to something. Well, beyond speech lies the unknown silence. Now he shifts. Now this is the shift, right? And this is a, <clears throat> uh, one of his short paragraphs. Uh, He's got a couple of real, real short ones. The, there are two running that are very, very short. And uh, they only go for two or three pages. <laughs> but we can try a, a bit of it, all right? Okay. I'm on page 21. <clears throat> Can we therefore prove anything concerning that? And is that demonstrable? About which we do not consider it possible even to make conjectures. Or do we mean that we can demonstrate concerning it, but cannot demonstrate it? Nor is the uh, demonstrable in it? For neither that nor any other thing is in it, nor is it, or is itself in it. But we demonstrate our own ignorance and speechlessness concerning it. And is this, that is demonstrable. What then? Right? Uh, what then? Are we not stating our opinions when we assert these things concerning it? But if there is opinion with regard to it, then surely it must be the subject of opinion. Or we must form an opinion as to what it is not. And this opinion is a true one, says Aristotle. Moreover, if the opinion is true, that by correspondent to which the opinion becomes true must be real. For the opinion derives its truth from reality of things. Yet, uh, how can that? Right. How can that, which is ineffable, a real thing, how can that, which is utterly unknown, be true? Or is the fact that it is not and, it is, and is unknown true, like that which is truly false, for it's true that it is false? Or do we bring together these opposites because the one in, is a privation of the other? See the way he's reasoning? Now this becomes his dialectic from this point on. So what do you think of our friend, our opening exploration of Damascus? Profound and beautiful. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And it goes into these same issues. Here they are. <coughs> Inherent, intuition. Right? We know what he's talking about when he goes beyond the one. Curious guy, isn't he? Yeah. And he wrote a big, thick book on it. So, So you, you can take a walk and you can say, I'm interested in knowing what is each thing I call a one? <clears throat> Because everything 
I can conceive or see or experience. Because each thing is distinguished from every other thing. So you look around, <clears throat> and you know what you're doing? You're wanting. Right? You're wanting. One, one, one. What is each thing I call a one? <clears throat> because each thing is distinguished from every other thing, and so each thing is a one. So what is the one? Wow. Huh. Uh, Damascus comes along as this interesting question you got there, but like it or not, uh, that's not as profound as recognizing that whatever it is you engage in, whatever, the real question is, shut up. And become true to the fact that everything is ineffable. Everything. 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 What's the difference between the two? Well, recognizing one's far beyond language um, and, you know, being able to stay in that mystery or appreciate that mystery of everything around you. I don't know if I answered the question. Okay. You think it's fair to call on Daniel then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Between ineffable and his vision of, of the first hypothesis, the idea of the one, in contrast to his view of the ineffable. Would you accept help? Raphael? I think his view of the ineffable is more profound. That's the biggest difference I see. <clears throat> sure, sure. Yeah, 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 sure. What's the difference between asking what, after all, is the one itself, which, of course, is the object of arithmetic in Plato's Republic, right? That's the basic meditation. What, after all, is the one? For you, what difference would it make to take the same issue and say, if all things are ineffable, including myself, what's the difference between holding on to that as a meditation and what, after all, is the one? That's what we're talking about. So we're talking about these two. Wouldn't it be that? Right, Mark? I'm starting to pick it up. No. Well, isn't he attributing? Can't hear you. He's attributing, as I understand it, to the one, some thing. It's, it's among the things. Beyond that is in I did. No, no, I did. Parmenides doesn't. Well, Parmenides, and the first hypothesis. Right. Yeah, but, go ahead. But Damascus, Damascus seems to equate the ineffable with the first hypothesis, but he doesn't call it the one. He calls it the ineffable. That's how I understand what he's doing. Yeah, okay. See. As he talks about the ineffable, 
part very clearly includes Parmenides' first hypothesis. Mm -hmm. A part goes beyond it. Beyond the first hypothesis? Or, or it's this. They're separate and distinguishable. Or one is superimposed upon the other and there's no difference. So, I guess I'd read it, reread it again. I don't understand then how it's beyond the first hypothesis. Well, okay. So I guess that, I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, you're um, Could you look at five, section five, and take a look and let us know what you see? Because, the, you know, close to the conclusion of section five, the one is thus altogether ineffable. At that point, which one is he talking about? One, two, or three? These are clearly distinguished one from the other. If it's altogether ineffable. The one is thus altogether ineffable. Is that separate? Depends on whether you use it adverbially or prepositionally. Right. If he means altogether and nothing left out, then it's which? Three. If it's two, they're separate. See, here's the whole, he's got the whole thing in this three sentences. The one is thus altogether ineffable. Shall we then seek anything beyond this? Therefore, it suggests it's three. Actually, I should put it differently. Uh, Could you outline what one, two, and three yeah, hold is? Hold it, Jenna. Okay. Perhaps Plato leads us ineffably to that ineffable, which lies beyond the one. Uh-oh, where did it go now? Two and one and one. That's into two, isn't it? Yes. Or one, one to two, but it moved from total identity, didn't it? Hey, you know what? I'm not going to give you a demonstration of it. There's no demonstration as possible. Ah, when you're talking about two and referring to the ineffable, I can't give you a demonstration of it. <clears throat> it's 
because it bases itself on intuition. Our intuition rises only as far as to the one. Nevertheless, because there is in us a vestige of the one, we should exert ourselves in reaching up towards it. Ah, uh -huh. but let that which is beyond be adored in complete science, silence, and mystical unknowing. Where did he put it? But let that which is beyond, right? We should exert ourselves in reaching up towards it. But let that which is beyond it be adored in complete silence and mystical unknowing. If it's completely beyond it, then he's back to two. No. That's not how I read it. He doesn't say that it's not the one. He's just, he's saying that our intuition rises only as far as the one. We, but we can't, we can't, it becomes ineffable after that point. Okay. If you read it that way, then you're here. Um, and, I'm saying that, that there's room here to agree and, and remove, to play back and forth with it. It's not, yeah. And hold on to the possibilities. Don't settle for one, because he may be referring at different times to one, two, or three. So, Pierre, can we go back to your question of um, the, what's the difference between doing what Damascus is doing, or, yeah, right, that's his name? And, uh, Arithmetic in the Republic. Some translations use in itself. But in suggests a container and the contained, and therefore it's inappropriate. <clears throat> but I think that's the question we're raising. What difference does it make to have this as an object of contemplation and the other? Well, it depends on which model you're going to use. <laughs> or you think that he's dealing with. Uh, he, he's challenging the logic of the first hypothesis or it's very foolish. That which is most unknown <clears throat> must be most transcendent of all. <clears throat> well, that which is most unknown is the first hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Total beyond knowledge. <clears throat> that which is most unknown must be most transcendent of all. So, come on, I need a couple of good quotes so we can play. Where would you put it? One, two, or three? And for what particular quote? 
<clears throat> well, I'm having, when I read five, and he says, the one says Plato, if it is, and he underlines is, is not the one. And if it is not, no words can describe it. I'm not clear if he's making the distinction between the first hypothesis or the second one, and it seems like if it is... Gina, it, when you say you're not sure of it, what should we do with that? If you say, I'm not sure of it, should I spend any time on that, wait for you to decide, or are you offering it? Well, I guess I'm confused at... <clears throat> Um, although he doesn't say it, it sounds like he is resting that there is, that it is, when you say it is, means it is not the one. So he would be putting ineffable and the one together, if I understand, and is is something that it is not, that the one is not. I mean, it's beyond is. You've got this. I'd say it was the second hypothesis, not the first. Okay, I say fir first or second, so I'd I don't have to draw another circle. Ineffable in the, <coughs> the ineffable and the first are the same. Okay, all right. Okay. The only question is now, can you hold on to that as you read more? That's all. The important thing is that you take a position, whichever one it is, anchor it in the text in respect to your judgment, then keep on going and see whether we can find something that even challenges that one. Or he's confused about the two. Pardon me? Or he's confused about the two. Um, I'll add that. <laughs> or he's confused about the two. Uh, you'd have to show that he's confused about the two because if he's confused about the two, it may mean that he's really in the one. And if, we, if or the third or the fourth. Yeah, David. Uh, well, looking at the question, if you said, uh, what after all is the nature of the one, uh, well, it's not the one that is What would this do for your meditation? Well, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I think no, I wondered about it first. Okay, yeah. No, <laughs> no, I'm saying this is very much like the Mahaprajna Paramita. So, that. let me give you go further. If you hold on to this notion, yeah. isn't that in itself a meditation? Because then whatever you're looking at is what? Ineffable. And what's looking is ineffable. There's that one poem, the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra. And mm. you know, if there's ever a reason to walk into a Zen monastery, it's so that you can sing that one a couple of times. Um, yeah, you might be able to get away with Buddhism on this one, huh? Yeah. I, I keep trying. No. no, no. And last, of course, <laughs> you have to remain silent. And that's part of what he's saying, hey, in silence and profound so silence. Choose what you're going to remain silent about. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're on page 22. I have a sentence. <clears throat> uh, 
On 22, I'm skipping a little bit. <clears throat> His conclusion, about five lines or six lines from page 22. Therefore, Plato is right in calling that ineffable and beyond the reach of opinion, which nowhere and in no respect is, according to the worst. Just as we speak of that as beyond opinion, according to the better. For indeed, we are forming opinions about that which is beyond opinion. And as he says, the argument is subverted. And in reality, we do not form any opinion. What then? Shall we not think and be persuaded that these things are so? The three principal faculties by which the soul gains. Principal faculties. Because there's more than those. Page are you on, Pierre? I'm, I'm lost. Louder, please. What page are you on? Uh, 22. Oh, 22. Okay. About five lines from the bottom. Okay. Not the footnote, but the text itself. Does this put us in a good place to pick it up next time? Right? Because then this is a, a good dialectic from this point on. Uh, I have it from someone who studied Usural that Usural stayed with Damascus for 40 years. He's the same friend of mine who's told me a lot of other things that I don't believe. <laughs> okay. <laughs>